It's now five o'clock on Monday afternoon. You've been with us for over two days now, learning about UNC, Moorhead Kane, yourselves, and each other. And you've perhaps been wondering when you might be able to see the inside of a classroom. Well, please know, given the challenges around COVID and varying university policies across academic divisions, it simply wasn't feasible for us to provide you with carte blanche. So we've done the next best thing, actually. We've quite likely done something even better. We're bringing the classroom experience to you. We are very fortunate to have Mitch Prinstein, Distinguished Professor of Psychology and Neuroscience and Director of Clinical Psychology at UNC on hand to teach a class and provide you with a taste of academic life. Mitch's teaching and scholarship is impressive. His opinions and ideas have been quoted in countless newspapers, journals, and other sources throughout the years, and his work always seems to capture the essence of the times. As a professor, he embraces innovation while respecting tradition, and he challenges his students to think outside the box. And while I don't know exactly what Mitch is going to say today, I do have a pretty good idea, and I'm quite certain you will all enjoy his presentation. I am very pleased to welcome and introduce to you Professor Mitch Prinstein. Class is now in session. Hey, everybody, how's it going? Good. My God, I'm taking off my mask in public. This is amazing. Um, I promise I'm safe. Uh, all right, let me make sure that this is up and rolling. And there it is. Um, I'm so excited to talk with you, and I'm so excited that you're here for this weekend, this extended weekend, to learn about Carolina. I, um, as you heard, I'm a professor in psychology and neuroscience, and my research is in the developmental and clinical child area. So in other words, I'm interested in young people, and a lot of what I've been studying for uh, more years than I want to acknowledge has been how kids get along with other kids and how important that is. So I'm going to tell you just kind of in a really overview way about some of the research of what we're learning about popularity in school. But before I start, I actually want to tell you about a study that was done outside the field of psychology and neuroscience. Specifically, it's a study that was done by a team of economists. So economists are really interested in knowing how it is that people earn their wealth. And they did a study to try and understand who makes more money than other people in terms of their salary. So they used a database where they had access to about 10,000 men's salary and other information that they had about them for years. Um, the information would be collected in the UK and they examined everything you can imagine. You know, they were looking at education level and socioeconomic status, things like that to try and predict salary. But they found something really surprising and curious. It turns out there was a relationship between height and um, salary. The taller men were, the more money they made. But here's what was interesting. It, it wasn't how much, it wasn't how tall these men were in their 30s, which was related to how much they made also in their 30s. It was actually how tall they were at the age of 16 that mattered more. The results somehow suggest that there's something about who we were back then in those high school years that still has an impact on who we are even decades later. And it's with that idea that I really want to start off our thinking about popularity because the fact is very few of us spend our years, our days when we're 16 years old thinking about how tall we are. But almost everybody when they are in high school um, is thinking at least a little bit about popularity. 
And I can tell you that having done research now for many, many years across people from every age, from 13 up to 103, if you ask them to tell you about high school, almost the first thing they'll tell you is about their popularity in high school. And sometimes it comes with the same raw emotion when they're an elderly person reminiscing as the feeling that they had during those actual high school days. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about popularity. Yes, oh my God, there's actually a science on popularity. That's what I do. I can't believe I'm paid to do that. It's so fun. Um, but it's true, and you'll see why. It ends up being uh, something that's really relevant to understanding psychology and health. So let me start by just telling you a little bit about popularity, because the way that we think about it, and the way that you've experienced thinking about that, maybe during your high school years, that actually only reflects one of two different definitions that scientists have found for popularity. So let's start with the first one. So starting when kids are age three, you can reliably identify which kids are popular or less popular. And unless you do something to change it, that level of popularity at age three is gonna be the same at 13, 33, and 103. It's a remarkably stable construct. But that version of popularity that I'm talking about is a version that is based on likability. So in other words, the more well-liked you are, the more popular you are in this particular definition. And what I mean by that is that people who tend to be really well-liked are people who make other, others around them feel happy, feel valued, and included. So this is someone you want to spend time with. It's someone that you enjoy the interactions with them. You feel inclus included um, in those interactions. Now, research has been done to try and understand likability as one form of popularity for now decades. And the research is remarkable uh, and surprising because what research has shown is that if you know how popular, a, uh, in other words, likable, a kid is in around third grade or so, that predicts in adolescence how happy they will be versus sad or depressed. It predicts their relationships um, in high school as well, friendships as well as budding uh, romantic partnerships. Those kids who are more likable tend to be more likely to get high grades and more likely to get into the schools of their choice. And also, those kids who are likable in elementary school tend to be more likely to engage in positive pro-social behaviors in high school, like volunteering, community work, things like that. So research has actually taken it even farther and tried to say, what do we know about these young um, elementary school kids? And it can predict things when they're as ancient and decrepit as someone my age, like in 50s or 40s or something like that. And the research actually says that over decades of time, we can predict who is likely to be hired, promoted, based on how likable they were in elementary school. We also can predict who's most likely to have a positive, fulfilling relationship with a partner from likability. Those who are highly likable in elementary school are more likely to experience less stress as a parent, and their children are more likable as a, uh, in, in relation to the, their own likability. And then interestingly, likability even predicts how long people live when following over decades and decades and what disorders people might suffer from in terms of physical morbidity or mortality. Okay, how could that be? How could likability, what happens on the playground in like third grade, how could that possibly have an effect that goes for so long? Well, I'll tell you, um, there are a few different reasons why they've been bolstered by findings like this. This was a study that was done with about 20,000 people. It was in Scandinavia, and they looked at those from elementary school who were least well-liked all the way to most accepted, and they looked at outcomes like higher education, um, their employment, their wealth, and sure enough, over 40 years, controlling for everything you could think of, SES and education and mental health issues and physical health issues, controlling for all of that likability was strongly associated with these particular outcomes. Okay, so the answer, why might this be even happening? Well, let's go back about 60,000 years when we were one of not, not the only, we were one of many different human-like species that were roaming around on the planet. Now, if back then you were placing a bet on which of these human-like or hominid species are likely to survive and make it to, you know, today, no one would have bet on us, right? We were smaller than the others. We were weaker. 
we needed to eat more frequently, we were not so good with cold temperatures like some of the other uh, human-like species. But there was one thing that we had that the other species did not, actually two things. It was a slight uh, genetic variation, a slight budding mutation that was in an area of the brain that allows us to both make and in a second area of the brain um, that allows us to understand sounds. We also had a little bit of a change in our voice box. And with that, while everyone else was only able to grunt, uh, we were able to like, huh? And that was just enough to like allow us to start language. So with that language, we became a social species. And we were able to suddenly hunt together, protect one another, warn another of dangers, work as a group or as a herd, and um, eat all of our food before it spoiled and we got salmonella. Well, all of this led to changes that we still see today in research being done now. One, in our brain, at the moment that you experience something socially rejecting, think about a breakup, for instance, we experience a surprising response in the brain. It turns out that the areas in our brain that get activated are the same areas that get activated when we experience physical pain. So people have called this social pain. Now, what I mean by that, of course, we have a couple different things that happen when we experience physical pain. Imagine putting your hand on like a hot burner. But one thing is our sensory cortex is like, whoa, that like tingles and is hot and I'm experiencing like physical pain. Not that part. The other part is that we take our hand off really, really fast, right? And that's because there's a part of our brain that is kind of the motivational network or the alarm system of the brain that says whatever you're doing right now, you have to do the opposite immediately. This is huge danger potential for you. Well, it turns out that second area is what happens when we experience a breakup, when we see people excluding us, when we're unfollowed on Instagram. You know, we have this immediate response in the brain that says, whatever you're doing, stop and do the exact opposite. We are biologically programmed to care how people think about us. The second thing that happens is actually all the way in our DNA. So, you know, we obviously have uh, whatever genotype we have. That's the DNA we're born with. We have it all the time. Can't change it. But some of our DNA is expressed and some is not. It's kind of like when you buy a new laptop and there's some programs that haven't really fully installed. You've got to double click them to install them on that hard drive. We have a lot of DNA like that too. And it's not really activated until something happens. Well, here in our lab at UNC, we Stress kids out a little bit, it's okay. We, but uh, within 40 minutes, we can see in their blood that we have activated genes, just as science suggests, turning on an inflammation response, shutting down viral immunity. Why, why would we do that? Well, because if you're kicked out of the herd and suddenly you're out of the cave wandering on your own, you're probably gonna get eaten by like a woolly mammoth or something, and you're gonna need your blood to clot really well, and you're gonna need to ward off bacterial infection but you don't need to be immune from a virus. Who are you gonna catch a virus from, right? Reference past two years. So, you know, so at the moment that we see that change in our social relationships, we can even see in our own lab here at UNC that this changes the expression of our DNA and it makes us more risk, uh, at risk for viral infections. Um, and it also throws off our whole checks and balances for inflammation disease. So it's one biological reason why it turns out that popularity, or at least our likability, super important. But let me give you a psychological reason as well. So it turns out that if you are more likable in little subtle ways, every single day is different. Someone is waving at you from across the playground when you're in elementary school. Someone's inviting you to join their game or to go to their birthday party on the weekend. When you're in college, you're more likely to get invited into study groups. Or maybe the professor is going to want to walk back to the, their office uh, chatting with you a little bit after class. Maybe um, when you get your job, the boss is going to want to chat with you a little bit after. Or other people are going to say, hey, let's all go out for a happy hour or something afterwards and talk a little bit about that meeting. Well, each of those little tiny opportunities actually creates a, a moment where you are building more skills. You're learning, how do I act at birthday parties? What do I do when everyone wants me to come to the same you know, play date at the same time? How, do I, um, how am I gonna learn all this extra material that I've just learned about work or my college course? And that creates actually a cycle. 
where these kids gain more skills that makes them more likable, they get more opportunities, and so on. Unfortunately, the exact opposite happens, not for people who are regular likability, but for those that really suffer with difficulties with likability. So actually, they're missing the opportunity to learn how to behave at a birthday party, because they were invited to maybe none. You know, and they're not getting the chance to learn extra material or learn how to study as effectively, because they're just alone. You know, and that happens, and it actually leads kids to have fewer skills than their counterparts, and then that makes them less likable over time. So here at UNC, I teach a class on popularity. We actually do it in a room just like this, really big. We want it to be a big class because one of the things that we do is the class designs together a teacher. And uh, every year the class does it differently based on whatever's cool at the moment, but we always get in a really loud, obnoxious color. And the reason why is because we all, myself included, we wear this t-shirt on the same day on campus. And this one said popularity is key. We also did kind of you like me back when Facebook was cool and not evil. Um, everyone likes me at UNC. I am, wait for it, awesome. You know, whatever. Whatever the students design is what we wear. Well, for a day, everyone on campus is like, why is everyone wearing that shirt? What's up? And they kind of laugh with us. You know, it's like a tongue in cheek kind of thing. And suddenly people get extra attention. And I say, okay, this is like one day of your life write a thought paper about how that went. Like, tell me, you know, what did you experience? And the students every year say, oh my God, I was like walking across campus, not looking down at my phone, but actually making eye contact with other people. And like I went out that night, I actually asked out the person I had a crush on for all these months. Or I raised my hand more often in class. You know, I felt more confident when I took my test. Just something about getting that extra attention all day and just having people smile at me all day. It changed my entire experience. One kid said, if, if I wore this t-shirt, um, if I could figuratively wear this t-shirt when I was in childhood, every day of my life in childhood, I would fundamentally be a completely different human being today. And that's really just powerful how in one day people are kind of tapping into what it's like for these really, really likable kids, or obviously in reverse, those who are really dislikable, how that happens over and over. Here's us in the Daily Tar Heel. We all stormed the pit together after class, all wearing our shirts, and, and the school newspaper kind of took a picture. Okay, so at the beginning I told you popularity can be defined in two different ways. And the way that I've discussed with you so far is relevant starting around the age of three, and it's relevant for our entire lives. But something happens at adolescence in our brains. And I want to talk to you about that now because it changes everything. So... Our brains develop just like our bodies develop, right, over puberty, but our brains develop a little bit, they start developing about a year or two before we start seeing physical changes to our bodies. So when it doesn't look like someone has really started to go through puberty, actually their brain has started to make changes. But your brain doesn't all mature at the same time. So it changes kind of from the back to the front over time. And from the part that's inside, which is our more kind of primitive brain structures, the parts that we share with a lot of mammals, and then um, it matures all the way to the cortex, which is like a hat that sits on top, and that's pretty unique to humans. In fact, the, um, some of parts of the cortex don't even fully develop till the age of 25, if at all. So, um, so, you know, when we're talking about those kids that are like 11, 12, you know, um, we're talking about what's developing first. Well, what happens is that one of the areas that develops first is in our social reward network. It's an area called the ventral uh, striatum. And basically, it's a hotbed for oxytocin and dopamine. And what that means is that suddenly we're really, really craving interaction with people our age, and it feels really, really good when we do. My daughter is 11. Um, she has developed an accelerated eye-rolling ability at her parents. Um, at exactly this time point, and suddenly whatever we do is like totally lame. Whereas, you know, like a year or two ago, we were just, she wants to do everything in the world that we were doing, and now like, ugh, please. So, you know, this is just, you know, this is a typical thing when parents say to me, oh my God, my kid doesn't want anything to do with me. I'm like, that's good, their brain is developing perfectly. Like, that's a good sign, right? Maybe evolutionary-wise, because there was once a day when this was the time where we had to learn to start caring about peer interactions and fending for ourselves. So it was a way to push us towards autonomy. Today, we see it, though, across all mammalian species. So even mice, 
who go through puberty in one week, by the way, so, you know, lucky them. Um, but even mice, during that week of their puberty, they are more interested in spending time with other adolescent mice than with adult mice. So this is something that we see just biologically, you know, overall. So what happens is that suddenly we become like total addicts for we want this attention that's going to give us that dopamine and oxytocin. We want visibility, power, influence. We want everyone to be talking about us and smiling at us and nodding, you know, at us, what we say. That's the kind of popularity that they make teen movies about, right? This form of popularity, I'm going to call it status, but it is coming because of that biological push in our brains at that time. Well, research has, you know, looked at what happens to these really high status people as well. Interesting story. It's a little bit different. Those who are really high status when they're in adolescence, it turns out that years later, they're at greater risk for depression and anxiety. We also find that they're more likely to experiment with substances, and they have substance use problems in some cases for many decades after these really high status people. High status people um, tend to be more physically attractive. They also tend to get more attention. So they do get, pr they do get hired more likely uh, than others, but they are also more likely to be fired or demoted than others. So they might get that initial kind of boost, but then they seem to have difficulties. And then, um, really interesting, those who are high in status, decades later, they um, report difficulties with interpersonal relationships, both with their partners, their friends, and even their kids. One interesting study was done by a researcher who brought back these really highly popular people when they were in their 40s, and not only brought them back, but brought back their romantic partners and their friends and said, you know, what's up with, with your relationship with this previously popular person? Um, and they said, you know, it's like they never left high school and they're still so concerned about status all the time, and I feel like I'm just used by them as a way to help them with their status. I don't actually feel like I'm connected with them. And research shows that, you know, indeed, these are folks that might go on being really aggressive or bullying towards others in the workplace or at home, because it does get you status, but it also makes people really, really dislike you. So really interesting how that all fits. So I want to just kind of talk a little bit about what the implications of all of this are then for us today. You are leaving high school. You are entering a new world. So what does that look like? Okay. I would like to tell you that the world completely changes when you graduate high school and everything's going to go back to normal. But I can't say that starting about 10, maybe 12 years ago. And here's why. So when my parents were growing up, um, this is what it looked like when peers interacted with one another. They tended to be, you know, in the same room, interacting, doing something while they looked in each other's eyes. When your parents were growing up, it might have looked a little bit like this. This is what it looks like now. So the way that adolescents interact with each other has now really, really changed. And it's changed in a way that has affected not just the teen generation, but it's affected all the generations. So let me talk just a little bit about what that looks like. Um, I wrote a book on this topic. It's a gift to you in your uh, materials coming here for this weekend. And around the same time, the same daughter who now has accelerated eye rolling capabilities, she was like four at the time um, when I started working on this years ago. And um, she was really in a frozen, right? Everything was Elsa and Anna back then. And she was begging me, please, please, can I get a coloring book for Elsa Anna? And when I reached down to get it in the supermarket, I saw this next to it. And while you might be able to recognize, um, you know, a lot of the faces on here, I, it turns out, was not an avid reader of Tiger Beat at all. So I didn't read it growing up either. What caught my eye, though, was in the middle here, this how to be social media famous. What? So I, you know, I had to kind of, for my um, understanding, like, what are they telling kids about this? And what it said in there, which may not surprise you at all, but it surprised me, was that there was story after story in there. And at the time, they were all talking about Vine, because that was a thing then. Um, but they were talking about how these adolescents were like, oh, I used to feel so awkward, and I wasn't sure where I fit in the world, and I didn't know what I'd be like growing up. And Right, so like total normal adolescent experience. 
And they said, but everything felt so much better once I reached my first 500,000 followers, and that's why you all need as many followers as possible. So here's what you do. Like anything you see, it doesn't matter whether you agree with it or not, um, keep it from your parents that you're on this and spend your allowance money to hire an agent to try and get as many followers as you can. Post anything you see, and if popular people post something, then you should re repost it or like it. Um, they said, look, this is, real, this is a career. It's not just a hobby, and you really need to focus on getting this. And this is a magazine, I believe, that's really for like 11 and 12-year-olds. And this is the message that was being sent. Every person's name was listed with their name, comma, the number of their followers. Like, that's their contribution to the world. That's their way of, of measuring their value was, you know, Jane Doe, 700,000 followers. So I, I saw that, what? I can't believe this. Like, I know I'm being old here, but it was really surprising, right? I mean, when I went to school, we had two paper cups and a string. There was no, like, devices or whatever. And I go home and, like, you know, I walk in, my wife is there, and I, like, throw the magazine down on the aisle, and I was like, you're not going to believe this. Look at the message that they're sending children right now. And when I put it down on the kitchen island, it... Uh, landed on top of a magazine she got, which was a Bon Appetit magazine. And the cover story on her magazine said, how to take pictures of your food to post on Instagram that will get you the most followers. I was like, oh, this is so not just for kids. And you know that now. But think, this is like five years ago, you know? And it turns out that, um, you know, CoverGirl has come out with a selfie line of makeup uh, to make you look better on selfies. Don't understand the chemistry of that, but okay. The Russian government, yes, they've been up to a lot um, <laughs> recently, but um, no, but they actually had reported all these public health announcements because they had many people dying of selfies, of taking selfies in dangerous places. Like the selfie stick market had reached billions of dollars. This is where we've kind of come. These data are, you know, old at this point, um, but I wanted to show you how quickly they changed. So about five years ago at the same time as that magazine, 71% of all U.S. teens are on social media. That's over 90 now, 90%. Um, only 60% of parents check children's profiles, and they're only checking the one they know about. They're not checking the Finster, right? Like, they don't know that that one exists. And only a third um, are talking with their kids about their kids' online social lives. Because parents, you know, this is new. They don't know what to ask. Like, oh, did you see any good talk things today like they don't they don't know what to say and how to engage in that so this is all happening pretty much without a lot of supervision well here's why that's important do you remember the region of the brain I mentioned a little while ago called the ventral striatum it's the area that kind of makes things feel really really good when we experience a social reward something that makes us feel bonded or connected to people our own age like peers so if someone smiles or laughs or nods or invites you to something or agrees with you or something, you know, that fires up. Well, right next to it is an area in the motivational relevance network, which is called the ventral pallidum. And basically it says, whatever just felt good, go get more of it. But this is happening below the cortex. So it's not like you consciously say, hmm, I think I want more of it. It's just like what we would say in the English language, like a craving or an instinct or a drive. It's just we suddenly feel like we want more of it. We can't really explain where that came from. So I want you to remember the ventral pallidum for a second, which I've given here as a green light because it's kind of like the brain's gas pedal. In contrast, the prefrontal cortex, that area that doesn't develop till the age of 25, that's the brain's brakes. So that's saying like, wait a minute, think about things, think rationally, think carefully. It's the brain's inhibition center. Okay, so a study was done where they looked at kids' brains while they were in an fMRI while they were on an Instagram-like platform. They showed them things that were cute and adorable and we should all feel rewarded by looking at and sure enough, they found that there was activation in the ventral pallidum, good. Then they showed them things that were either illegal, harmful, dangerous, or amoral. And they saw that there was activation in the prefrontal cortex, good. Everything adults have taught young people is working. Um, it seems like when you're facing something that might be dangerous or immoral, you're saying, wait, hold on, let me hit the brakes, except when they showed the same kinds of pictures with one small change, an icon to show that it got a lot of likes. As soon as that was there, the activation of the prefrontal cortex shut off. So what kids were seeing in this study on Instagram 
And when they saw that associated with a measure of popularity, of high status, it changed the way their brains were processing things illegal, immoral, dangerous, and unhealthy. Everyone uses social media these days. There are different kinds of platforms for different people. Again, this is a bit out of date now. TikTok and Instagram would obviously be way, way higher than Facebook right now. God only knows what meta is and when that's going to take over, but nevertheless, the idea is persistent across all of the different platforms, um, even though that research was on Instagram. So what can you do? Okay. So you're about to go to college. Congratulations. Um, we did surveys to understand peer relationships of people coming here to UNC Chapel Hill. We asked every single person who came here over summer orientation, getting ready to come, about their peer relationships. And almost everybody, look at these numbers, are coming for a fresh start. Um, lots of people come with friends, and that's, you know, of course, but lots of people come to college saying, I am very excited to meet new people, maybe have a new reputation, maybe have a new group of best friends. This is a fairly universal phenomenon. So you have a choice. You can do a variety of things the same, or you can do them differently. What we find is that if you don't think about it, you'll probably do the same thing you did before. So let me tell you about some things you could do differently if you are really thinking about it and you want to. You might not want to, which is fine too. One thing to really think about is who we were back then. It might be hard, it might be difficult to recognize that maybe we were a little bit too much into status or not enough into status. Maybe we were very likable or not so likable back then. The reason why that's important now is because it's totally changeable. And one of the ways that we can change it is to recognize that that has created a bias or a filter that is affecting the way that we see every single social interaction in our lives. So I talk about this a little bit in the book. I'm going to show you an example of it now. But, but even now, at this very moment, you may be aware of the person sitting next to you. You may be wondering if they're looking at you, thinking the same thing as you. You might be aware of what happened five minutes before you walked in here. Or, oh my god, when is this guy going to shut up so I could check how many things came on my Instagram feed you know, over the last 40 minutes. Whatever it is, you're having social interactions all the time. Let me show you one that's been intentionally stripped down so it has so little information being displayed, I believe that you can't help but see everything in this scene. Okay, so mostly social interactions are very, very complicated and ambiguous. There's usually so many different cues to attend to that a first step of how we engage in social interactions is which things did we notice and which things did we not. I tried to control that difference by making this so simple. Hopefully everyone knows there was three circles and a, and a box. So, um, so you, you couldn't not see all the information. But when seeing this information, you might have had different responses to it. I've now shown that exact video to thousands and thousands of people of all ages across all different communities. What people say when I ask them, what do you just see? First of all, um, almost everybody, especially those not on the PDD spectrum, will anthropomorphize these circles and the square. So they see them as people engaged in a social interaction. But some say, oh, it looks like they're having fun. I think those two are dissing blue. It looks like they're playing tag. It looks like they're blinded by rage. These are actual responses. Blue is a narcissistic lover. It looks like a tickle fight. <laughs> There's no right answer. Every interpretation is completely valid. There's no other information other than what I just showed you. But isn't it interesting that you can show people the exact same interaction and they can come away with remarkably different interpretations. This happens in our lives, too. For those people who were nothing but popular and likable and had wonderful experiences, there is a bias that you might be missing out in real situations where rejection is occurring or you have the opportunity to get important feedback and evaluation. You're not seeing it. For people who have had difficulties with likability and they were not as popular as they would like, you might be seeing people as being a little bit more aggressive than they are in every one of those cases. Sometimes maybe they are, sometimes they're not. 
but you might be anticipating and seeing it a little bit where it's not there all the time. So recognizing our bias and knowing how we can address that is a really important way of changing our popularity. The next thing we have to do is we have to recognize, and we all know this, I know, but um, we I also teach class on social media, and um, we, ask, uh, we ask students in our class, it's usually, again, a big class, 200 people, and we say, um, how, how long after you see a post does it occur to you that maybe it was doctored, curated, you know, it was somehow altered to make life look better than it was? And a lot of people say, yeah, I kind of think that immediately, but, but at least half the, the class says, sometimes it's like not for a few hours until I'm still thinking about that post, and I'm like, oh, right. I forgot, that probably wasn't even real. You know, we have to kind of keep in mind that the world is really pushing us now to care about status. These social media companies and these platforms that we're on, and they're fun and they're fine, and with moderation, it's probably okay to engage in, but they weren't built to give you enjoyment. They were built to make a profit. <laughs> and um, in order to make a profit, they have to keep you on there as long as possible. So they're tweaking that dopamine oxytocin region on purpose to make sure that you are gonna stay on for as long as possible. And that's making you focus on the status aspects. You know, when I log in now to Twitter to talk to both of my followers, um, <laughs> I, it doesn't even tell me, you know, who liked my post. It just tells me a number. Or if I log on to Facebook, because I, yes, I am that old, and after my birthday, it, do, it says like, you know, 200 people wished you a happy birthday, but not the names. I actually have to dig to find the names. It's not pushing me towards likability, to establish relationships and connection. It's just pushing me to a status indicator, a number. So think about that. Are offline experiences just opportunities to take photos and post about them and get more likes? Or are people in the offline opportunities actually engaging with the people who are sitting two feet in front of them and kind of being in that offline moment together? We all do a little bit of both, but it's a good opportunity to remember, wait a minute, this is an opportunity for likability, and I'm actually getting pushed to think more about status. Focusing on likability is hard. It is something, especially in today's world, it is something that's important, and it often can happen when we're thinking about community and empathy, when we're thinking about inclusion and equity, recognizing that our culture in the West, in the United States and Western Europe and Canada, we're very unique in this regard. There is no word for popularity in some Eastern cultures, in particular in China. We did um, cross-cultural research. They don't have a word for popularity that means quite the same as how we think about it. This idea of us really trying to focus on being somehow more notable than others, more attractive or powerful or influential than others, that's a choice. That's something that we do in at least the Western culture really emphasizes, but we don't have to do that. We can also spend time thinking about how to be a connector with others, and how to help everybody be heard. So hopefully, um, one thing you've taken away from the last 40 minutes or so is that popularity matters. And we are biologically programmed to care about popularity. No matter how much we might say, oh, I don't care about that, we actually are. But you have a choice. You can use that biological urge to do something that is going to lead to decades of happiness, success, good health, long life, or you can use that biological instinct to pursue something that research says might lead to opposite outcomes. Um, and it's your choice to make. I hope that this is helpful in informing that decision. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We have an opportunity for a few questions, and I'm going to pass the mic, so if we can see some hands, we'll see if we can get them in. So I'm going to start in the middle over here. We're going to go with Charles. Can you help pass that back there? Hi. Well, thank you so much. That was really, really interesting. Oh, How do you measure likability? How do you measure status? Is, is it like easily quantifiable, or is it just something that's like... Yeah, great question. It's totally quantifiable. So what we do, and this is a process that people have been doing for decades, you actually go into a classroom or a grade and you give them a roster of all of their grade mates or classmates. You say, who do you like the most? Who do you like the least? 
And from that, you can actually divide folks based on the number of nominations they get for each of those into five categories of likability. Those who are accepted, those who are rejected. Those who are neglected, they don't get nominated for very much at all. They end up doing pretty well. Um, those who are controversial, people either love them or hate them, they might end up with higher status. And then people who are average, which is like two-thirds of people. And this is a thing where average is good, so you want to be average. Um, that's how you get likability. For status in English, we just say um, in high school ages, we say who's most popular, who's the least popular. And that word popular is so loaded, there's nothing else we need to say for people to be like, I totally know which kind of popularity you're talking about. The correlation is higher among males. Um, those who are likable are also a little bit more likely to have high status. You have some people who are both. But in a horrible message to females, those who identify as female, um, the, those who have the highest status are hated and vice versa um, among females. That's horrible because it's, you can be likable and have high status as a female, yes, 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 but not in high school, you know. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's a very different story there. Um, I, thank you for that. I was wondering, um, assuming that most social environments are like generally positive characteristics mean you're likable and negative mean you're not, in situations where a person assumingly has positive characteristics but they're in an environment where they're disliked and everyone around them is negative, are they psychologically affected the same way? Sorry, let me just make sure I understand the question because it sounds uh, really interesting. Are they affected by them being associating with people who are disliked? Like if with people who you were saying sometimes we're perceiving people as being aggressive when they're not and yeah. our lack of uh, interaction makes us less likable because we don't know how to interact. So for people who they do have the right characteristics but their environment is still rejecting them, are they still psychologically affected the same way? Yeah, that's a great question. Likeability is determined by a whole range of factors but some of it is the community and what the community values, right? So some people who are experiencing all the, who have all the skills, to be likable, but they're in a community where they're penalized for whatever characteristic or attribute that people are unfairly kind of uh, addressing. Um, they can do really well by moving into another environment or finding a few, a few other folks they can band together with. The really good news is that um, even the most disliked, unpopular kid can do really, really well with one very close friendship. Um, that seems to buffer a lot. So that's really an important message. Thanks for your question. Um, hi, thank you so much for your talk. It was really informing. Over here. Oh, thanks. Okay. Sorry. Um, it's like one quick question, and uh, then a more deep question. First of all, I mean, you're a pretty successful guy. Were you popular when you were no. younger? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I was. I was the nerd that made the morning announcements in high school every morning. Um, so, oh my God, that's a that's a visceral response. Okay. No, I was super short and nerdy and bifocals and like 90 pounds, not popular status. But I think likable, I mean, you know, it was kind of voted as being like school spirited and chatterbox and funny. So I, I kind of felt a lot so, soulless in the research, honestly. Like, oh, right, that kind of makes sense. Like, likability matters and status kind of has an expiration date. Okay, and then also, yeah. um, at the beginning of your presentation, you said that likability remains relatively stable throughout life, um, with a few exceptions, and so could you give an example of something that would cause, or tends to be like a causative factor in the reason somebody's likability would change throughout their life? Yeah, so the th um, not starring in a Netflix movie that you know leads to like a makeover and a whole new life the next week, like, no, all those movies are false. So, um, but doing the things that I mentioned at the end, so um, really paying attention to those biases and filters is really important. Usually we are doing something that we don't realize. That doesn't mean that it's because of us, but our relationships are transactional. We bring something into the equation and people respond to what we bring in and vice versa. In some cases, people are doing everything that would be appropriate, but they're in an environment that is harsh and unfair based on whatever that person, their own characteristics may be. Apart from that, though, there's some really interesting research on social mimicry. They did actually a speed dating study where they had people come in and purposefully act like a little bit sad and, you know, sad trombone, like, oh, hello, I'm not so excited about being here. And immediately everyone around them was like, I feel bad about myself now. Like, that person's bringing bad energy. So a lot of times people just have to recognize what are you giving off non-verbally and what might you be seeing through your own filters 
that could be contributing. And then it's totally fixable. And when you do that, like when you're going from high school to college, for instance, if you're paying attention to those things, you get, it, it can all be different again um, when you get to that new environment. Yes. Um, okay, so at the beginning of your slideshow, you said that less likability leads to less status, which can lead to less opportunities. So me personally, when I was in elementary school moving to a primarily white institute for the first time, I experienced bullying because people had generally bad opinions of Middle Eastern people, um, and that sort of passed down to their children. So do you think that with racial inequity, less likability because of pre, um, preconceived notions of people of color can lead to less resources and sort of perpetuate that poverty cycle. 100%, this is, the, this is the nefarious nature of systemic racism and biases is that the effect is not just on how people feel, it's on DNA and bodies and health and opportunity. This is why this is so important that we're finally talking about. The other thing that's really interesting in the popularity research is that people have not done enough to recognize that popularity is very complex when you're someone who is a numerical minority within a group that represents a, a larger group. Because often it means something different to be popular, either status or likability, within your affiliated group if one affiliates with those who look like them or come to similar backgrounds or something. And because compared to being popular within the broader group, and um, sometimes, in fact, being popular with one costs you in popularity with the other. And that we've done some research on that to really demonstrate that this is far more complex than people have been talking about in the literature. And it's one of the, uh, the things that I think is so important about conversations around diversity, equity, and inclusion. So we're recognizing that this is something that people with privilege have not had to deal with. You know, you're focusing on, I need to do this to be likable or popular, and that's all I have to care about. But there might be like three different code switching situations that people are having to you know, contend with um, for folks who are in a numerical minority within whatever school context they're in. Thank you for the question. Hi, I have a question that's kind of you know, a little bit connected. You touched briefly on the end about Western culture having this very loaded definition of the word popularity that Eastern cultures like China do not have. And I guess I wondered you know, whether if your research went into this, um, if there's a correlation between that kind of Western status symbol and the, the search for status and colonization? Um, that's a great question. I, what I can say is that in the United States, we collected the same data, same methods, same year, simultaneously in China and in America. And we did it in a rural and in a, an urban area within China. Um, the more aggressive you are, the higher you go in status in America. Um, the more aggressive you are, the lower you are in status. And the version of it that they can, that um, in this community we were able to translate to, the lower you are in China. And in fact, being more withdrawn and cooperative gains you popularity. The, the high school cool kind of, you know, status gains you status in China and you lose status in the West. So you can dotted line that to so much of what we experience in the world, yeah. This is going to be the last official question, but perhaps Professor Princeton will linger a little bit for those that might have pressing questions, but um, this will be our last one officially. Hi, thank you again Hi. for the lecture. It was really cool to listen to. Um, so you mentioned in your slides a bit about bias, and I saw something on the bottom that was like recognize, like adapt, overcome. Um, but with like the understanding and the research that's gone into unconscious bias and how that also affects um, the way that people interact with each other and um, how people are perceived socially, do you think it's truly possible to actually overcome these biases? And if not, what can people like that you're speaking of, of those numerical minorities truly do or like, can they actually reach that like level of total popularity or like um, to reach those high statuses that guarantee things like likability and being able to go far in life, that kind of stuff? Yeah, uh, um, you know, no, knowing that, uh, knowing that um, you all have to run to your food trucks, I'll say um, really briefly that there are a lot of ways that it can be overcome and there are a lot of ways we all have responsibility for that. So, you know, I think that it's sometimes as simple as just kind of checking before responding. So someone walks by, their shoulder hits your shoulder, you know, were they like purposefully trying to like be more dominant than you or did they literally not even see you? And it was just an accident. And just kind of stopping being like, hey, oh, um, 
did, did you mean to hit my, you know, or just some way of like just checking for a second instead of like, what the, and like immediately responding. Um, it's sometimes as easy as that, and sometimes it really means going into super slow-mo, and anyone who's agonized over a text to send to someone that they just went on a first date with knows what I mean. Like, it's going into that super slow-mo and being like, okay, wait a minute, what could this mean? Let's think of 37 possibilities of what was meant by that text. And, and really just trying to check it out and be open. Imagine a world where we are all just open to ideas and reactions without judgment. You know, and just, you know, wow, you seem to be angry in that situation. Like, what are you thinking? You know, instead of just responding back with equal anger. You know, that, that's idealistic, obviously, but it really is based on this idea that the way that our brains and, our, and we're used to responding to things are happening through everyone's biases and lenses. We all have different ones, and we all come by them naturally. None of them are wrong or right. And the more that we can be open and inclusive and communicative and non-judgmental, that's what gets us to all feel happy and valued and included. Thank you so sure, thank you. Thank you all for, for giving Professor Princeton your, your attention. I don't know what each of you might have been thinking during that presentation. But I was thinking about some things. One, it was like a free life coaching session. <laughs> like, I need to take stock of some of my own behaviors. I encourage each of you to think deeply about what you just heard. You know, by way of your relationship with us, in our invitation for you to join this community, that we believe you have the ability to make differences and to influence and impact. We also feel that you have some responsibility to do that. These are some of the challenges of your generation. We know you will embrace them in your own special ways, but wow. I was also thinking, man, I want to go back to school, right? If I get to take classes like that in a class in social media, holy smokes. And the research that comes with it, really, really remarkable. Now, I want you to just kind of go back in history a little bit. Not very far, just like 46 hours or so. It was Saturday night. And I want everyone here to thank that amazing professor the way we cheered on Saturday night. Can we thank him one more time? So I imagine the professor will stay for a few minutes and answer questions if anyone has one for a few minutes, but the food truck rodeo is about to begin. Class is dismissed. Have fun tonight, everyone. <laughs>